thanks so much and we'll see you a little later. Thank you, Alex. Thank you all for joining in today and taking a part of your weekend to be with us. This is the third of a series of presentations about the history of the work in the Temple families. The first was about how members of the families got to Mexican California from Massachusetts by way of Hawaii, in the case of Jonathan Temple, William Workman from England to the United States to New Mexico, then part of Mexico into California. We then carried the story into the 1840s at the end of the Mexican era as the families were engaged in cattle ranching and had stores and other kinds of enterprises got involved in the American seizure of Mexican California during the Mexican-American War. And that took us to the very end of the 1840s. And we'll see with this presentation how much things were changing in the course of the following decade. And so the plan with this is to go through basically decade by decade and talk about the families in the context of what was going on in greater Los Angeles. So again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Gold, Guns, and Growth is, of course, alliteration, but also does deal with some of the things that we'll be talking about as major issues, the discovery of gold in Northern California, the violence that happened in Los Angeles during that period, and the growth was happening locally, regionally, and within the family as well. So we'll start with that ending point of the last presentation, which was the American seizure of Mexican California. This is a map showing the Battle of Los Angeles, as it was called. This is where the United States for the second time took Los Angeles. They did this uh, first in the summer of 1846. The Californios revolted because of onerous things being put on by the Americans, curfews and that sort of thing, basically martial law in, in many ways. So the Americans had to regroup and come back to Los Angeles from San Diego and had a battle in what is now the city of Vernon, very heavily industrialized area, and then came into Los Angeles. William Workman had a pretty significant role in that. And maybe being British by origin, he had something of a neutral role in that. The aftermath of the war then led to the treaties that you would, uh, of course, see after that. And the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was being created in the latter part of 1847. And that would be the, the end of the war. And just as the treaty is ratified by the Mexican Congress, that was on February 2, 1848, nine days before that, James Marshall was building a mill for John Sutter on the American River up in the mountains of the Sierra Nevadas east of Sacramento and found gold. And that ushered in the Great Gold Rush nine days before Mexico ratifies the treaty. So it's just one of those confluences of events that are pretty momentous. Whatever changes the war brought out, to this area, the gold rush had a far greater impact on what was happening. The number of people, for example, who came out, the estimates vary, but roughly a quarter million, 250,000 people came to California in just a short time at the very end of the 1840s and the early 1850s. This was an area that had fewer than 10,000 non-natives before gold was discovered. And so you, you can imagine just from that number, how much things had changed. Beyond that, California was a bit of a puzzle for federal officials in Washington because of its orientation vertically on the map, geographically. It was a problem in terms of trying to determine what to do when it became a state because there had been a compromise with Missouri back in 1820 by which they would have alternating admission of states that would be slave and free, south and north. California was both south and north. So there was a real issue about how to deal with that. So even though the war had ended in California early in 1847. Statehood did not happen for three and a half years. And the military was left to basically govern California. And that was difficult for them because they weren't really equipped to do that to begin with. And then when gold uh, was found and the gold rush broke out, you can imagine how many soldiers went AWOL, deserted their posts and went digging for gold. So there really wasn't much of a government, which also meant not much law enforcement, courts, that sort of thing. It was a pretty chaotic situation during the gold rush years. And as bad as that was, say, in the mountains where gold was being mined, it was particularly bad in other places like Los Angeles. Now, when the gold rush happened, people did leave this area and go up and try their hand. Actually, the very first people to get to the gold fields, other than those who found it, were 
Mexicans from the northern states of Sonora and Sinaloa, where there was a lot of mining activity, and these were experienced people, so they would got up to the mines very quickly, and a lot of them did quite well. But as more people came from the United States, from Europe, from South America, and from China, where the Chinese were looking for Gold Mountain, there was obviously a lot of competition, but also a lot of race-based, ethnic-based conflict going on as well. People were coming from the United States, for example, who were saying, this is America, these people shouldn't be here, even though a year or so before that, it was still part of Mexico. In Los Angeles, some people did also go dig for gold. So FPF Temple, a member of the family who had come in 1841 to join his brother, Jonathan, who had been a merchant in Los Angeles since the late 1820s, and who was married into the family of William and Nicolasa Workman, owners of Rancho La Puente, he went up in spring 1849 to prospect. Now, whether he was able to find much gold, we don't know, but what he did do was make some contacts in the Tuolumne County area, the Southern Mines, and there were new camps coming up. Sonora, named obviously for those miners that came up from that Northern Mexican state. There was also Columbia, which is now a state historic park, Springfield, and other communities. And he began to obtain property very early on. So he probably realized quickly that the best way to make money wasn't necessarily to dig for gold. It was to find a way to get involved in things like bringing your cattle up, then slaughtering them and having butcher shops so that you could sell the meat. And that way you've got a way to get a consistent income rather than try to deal with whether you're going to find gold or not. This is a, a map that shows basically the grapevine north of Los Angeles. So Castaic Lake is down here, Santa Clarita, you know, where, where Six Flags is, will be just outside of this map to the bottom. And then you get up into the Tejon area. And so this is where people would be bringing their cattle from the large ranches of greater Los Angeles, where the cattle economy had been dominant for many years. Previously, for the hides or skins to be made into leather goods and the tallow, rendered into soap and candles. But now you've got a market for fresh beef. But this march from Los Angeles through the grapevine into the Central Valley and up to the mines was about a six week trip. And over time, the workmen's and temples were able to obtain some property in this area, either by uh, leasing or eventually owning parts of it. So the great Rancho Tejon, which is still privately held up in this area, Jonathan Temple, member of the family owned half of that ranch in the late 1850s and into the 1860s. And then his half brother FPF Temple owned Rancho San Emilio with a partner during this era as well. So this was a place you could stop, graze your cattle, get them water, rest for a bit before you moved into the Central Valley and on your way up to the gold fields. There was an established route in the Southern Central Valley uh, where Bakersfield would wind up going. This is a map from about the early 1850s. There actually was a very large uh, lake in the middle of the Central Valley and a smaller one, actually a couple smaller ones uh, down towards Bakersfield. That all got drained out later as agriculture was brought in and, and so ha what have you. But those were fed from the, the big rivers that came out of the Sierra Nevada mountains to the east. So she came up from the grapevine here into the Central Valley. You could either go off to the left and make your way up to the Bay Area kind of like I-5 today, or you went up to the east side of the valley, like California Highway 99, and you would make your way up to the gold fields from Los Angeles. So a long trip, but it could be well worth it for these ranchers because the price of cattle had skyrocketed as many things did during the gold rush. So in those Southern mines of what became Tuolumne County, Columbia was a major area for FPF Temple in particular, but I would imagine that he had some funding from his father-in-law, William Workman, and maybe even from his brother, Jonathan Temple. As I mentioned, this is a state park. You can go through and see a lot of the old buildings today. And they actually have some uh, research that somebody had done back in the 1960s on FPF Temple's activity. And it was really enlightening to go up there and be able to, to get those research materials and learn more about what he was doing. He was pretty active uh, in these areas. Another location is Sonora, which is to the east basically of Springfield, uh, the main street here. If you've ever been there, there's some hills uh, to the west side of town. And, and this is the main street of Sonora today. And that was a pretty active area as well with all the gold uh, activity going on. And again, uh, FPF Temple had his enterprises going on in that city or that town. 
So Springfield is lesser known. It doesn't really exist much there. There's a few houses out there, but like a lot of those mining towns, it was a, a booming period. So there were maybe a couple thousand people there at its peak. And then it sort of faded away over time, but it was named Springfield because water came out in springs from there. And why that was valuable was because the miners would take their um, material, you know, dirt, silt with the gold flakes in it down to the springs to wash them out. And so FPF Temple owned quite a bit of property there. He had a large ranch. This is where he had his house, where he lived when he was visiting the gold mines. And he had a number of um, slaughterhouses and then some butcher shops in those communities I just mentioned and even a couple of others that I won't talk about that were in that area. So pretty big enterprise. And he had property there all the way into the mid 1870s. So roughly about a quarter century. Now the wealth from the gold rush is going to allow the workmen's and temples to acquire more property as they're making significant sums. And this was wealth for not just them, but many other ranchers, Californios included, when in the hide and tallow era, money was sometimes not even what was transacted, it often was just bartering for goods. And so the, the staggering amount of wealth that came out of this period really enabled people to do a lot of things, whether it was improve their houses, buy more luxury goods, or invest in property. So for William Workman, who lives, lived at what is now the Homestead Museum, he was half owner with John Roland of the Rancho La Puente, almost 50,000 acres in its fullest extent, but he and members of the Temple family get, began to expand in other uh, land enterprises as well. Initially very close by. So to the right of this slide here, this is the San Gabriel River coming through this area into what is called the Whittier Narrows. At one point, the, the Rio Hondo was the old San Gabriel River, and that would be off more over here to, the, to this side of, the, of the, the map. But La Puente was on the east side of the San Gabriel River. So William Murpin's ranch is basically, this is one of the big boundary lines here. He's living just off, off the map to the, to the side here. He loan, uh, borrows money, uh, pardon me, loans money to a woman named Casilda Soto de Lobo, one of the few women to own ranchos. And incidentally, women could own real property because of the existing system that was carried over from Mexico and before that Spain. Whereas much of the United States, women couldn't own real property during this era. But Casilda, like a lot of people, was land rich and cash poor. If you're not able to make use of the property you have, especially when new things are being introduced by the Americans like property taxes, that can be a real issue. So she borrowed a couple thousand dollars from William Workman at the prevailing interest rates, which were quite high. They could often be three, four, five percent per month. And so if you don't pay your loan within a year or two, your interest could be very, very high. And so she was not able to pay the loan back and workmen foreclosed upon her. And don't forget that if you come back to the talk about the 1870s, we'll note the irony of that. But workman then takes possession of this Rancho La Merced, which again was west of the San Gabriel River, went out to a very unusual point, basically where Monterey Park and Montebello meet as the 60 freeway climbs a hill. There's a dump on one side of the freeway and on the other side is some shopping areas. And so you're looking at the Montebello Hills, parts of the city of Montebello, a little bit of South Almonte area. A partner and friend of the Workmen's and Temples, Juan Matias Sanchez, who knew them, who knew William Workman that is in New Mexico, he came to California in the late 1840s, became William Workman's mayordomo or foreman at La Puente. And then when Workman obtains La Merced, he gives half of it to Sanchez and half to Workman's daughter and her husband, this is Antonia Margarita Workman in FPF Temple. What Sanchez does is he moves into the Soto Adobe, which was situated basically right about here, maybe where the sea is, uh, on a slope or a, a rise in the Montebello Hills, whereas the temples decide to settle right by the rivers in a flatland area. Sanchez in 1852 obtains this rancho called Procrero Grande, about 4,000 acres. And this is basically South Almani area today. And then by the end of the 1850s, he transfers half of that to his compadres, William Workman and FPF Temple. And in fact, those three men will continue to expand their, their holdings in this area into the 1860s. And we'll talk about that in the next presentation. There are other lands that are obtained. I mentioned uh, Tejon up in the uh, grapevine area, San Emilio. Jonathan Temple bought a large rancho called El Consuelo in what is now Tulare County, 
and it was valued at $95,000 at the time, which was a pretty significant amount of money. And he had thousands of cattle there. So there were other areas of investment. And later in the 1850s, Jonathan Temple supposedly owned a, a very large amount of land between Acapulco and Mazatlan on the west coast of Mexico. So again, this was a time of, of wealth and expansion in the areas that I've mentioned. One of the big issues that came along though, during the early 1850s, it's really a, an outgrowth of the war is what's called the California land claims process. And simply put, there had been an article number 10 in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo negotiated by Nicholas Trist of the Americans with the Mexicans. And that article was going to guarantee that all the land grants made under Spain and Mexico in the territory that America sees from Mexico, not just California, but also what would now be Arizona into New Mexico and so forth, those grants would be respected. Now, Trist was not authorized to make those kinds of concessions. So when President Polk, members of his cabinet and members of Congress found out they were furious and they immediately struck that article out of the treaty. The Senate voted, I think, 33 to 19 to remove that article. But to this day, there are people who believe that Article 10 was part of the finished treaty and it was not. So what had to happen then is that Congress had to decide what to do with these grants. And the result was the creation of an act on March 3rd, 1851. And it basically is known in, in shorthand as the California Land Claims Act. What it required was the owners of these properties granted under Spain and Mexico to go to a commission with documents, uh, the granting document, any diseños or maps, and also have witnesses go before the commission or have written testimony that would verify the ownership and the settlement and, and use of these ranchos. So put the burden upon the owners of the property to prove that their grants were valid rather than have the government try to prove that they weren't. Now the commission was a three person one. It began in San Francisco and then they had a session in the fall of 1852 in Los Angeles. They heard over 800 of these throughout California and two thirds of them were approved. In other words, the claimants were determined to be valid. So the, the majority were, were given these approvals but written into the legislation was an automatic right of appeal of either party. And the federal government's policy was to appeal these cases as far as the United States Supreme Court if necessary, regardless of the merit. And so the federal government really wanted to open up land. That was their whole goal behind this. The average time to do this was about 17 years. So if you start in 1852, you're talking about basically 1870. And a lot of things are gonna happen in between that. You're gonna have the, the great boom of the gold rush and then the bust or the, the end of that. There'll be floods and droughts locally. And in fact, throughout California in the first half of the 1860s, people will die in the course of 18 years. And then land may be divided among many children and that becomes a problem. You have to hire lawyers and surveyors. And so it becomes a pretty onerous thing for a lot of people. The Californios, the Spanish speaking residents of the area had additional issues because they weren't as familiar with the legal system of the United States. They had to hire lawyers. There may have been language barriers. In some cases, it was fraud uh, by attorneys. In other cases, there was just bickering among family members about what to do with dividing property. So it was a, it was a pretty big situation. A lot, of, a lot of problems happened. A lot of land was lost in between that early 1850s and into the 1860s. Even Anglos, like the Workmans and Rollins, did not escape these problems. I'll mention another one, a guy who lived in what is basically the, the area along the San Gabriel River in uh, La Mirada and South Woody and all that, a guy named Carpenter. He got into such financial trouble trying to deal with his land claim that he borrowed money from a guy named Downey and wound up having to turn his property over to John Downey, who became the governor of California. And that's where the city of Downey obviously came from. And Carpenter killed himself because of the financial distress. So this is a, an American going through the struggles of this. Although again, the Californios in larger numbers had a lot more issues as well. But for working and Roland with their Rancho La Puente, they filed their claim in 1852. It took 15 years for them to get their patent from the federal government. And during the 1850s, they got through the commission pretty quickly. Their case then went on appeal from the federal government to the local federal district court in Los Angeles. The judge there heard the evidence. And one of the problems that Workman and Rowland had was that when Pio Pico did a second grant to La Puente, the first grant was in 1842 by a different governor, Alvarado. 
that said four square leagues, about 18,000 acres. When Pico regranted the rancho, he mentioned the entire boundaries of the ranch, but did not say how many square leagues or how many acres. And then the state assembly, not state assembly, the departmental assembly under Mexico, when they approved the grant, they specified four square leagues, which is probably not what Pico intended, but he didn't give them clarity either. And so that caused a problem. And so the district judge in 1856 ruled that the grant should only be for four square leagues or 18,000 acres. And for work on a rolling, this meant two thirds of their property was gonna go away. So they actually had a, a lawyer file for a rehearing. The same judge heard the case a year later in 1857 and he changed his ruling and agreed that it should be 11 square leagues, the entire boundary of the rancho and about 49,000 acres. But as we'll talk about in the 1860s portion of this uh, presentation, there will be a continued problem with that as the federal government continued to argue that it was four square leagues. In any case, this issue was not resolved in the 1850s. Rupp and Rowland still had to wait a while longer to get their land patent. One benefit they did have though, is that when they paid property taxes, they only paid on the 18,000 acres because that had not been fully determined yet. Now, meanwhile, the families are going to be growing. You know, William Workman and his wife, Nicolasa, they had a son, Jose or Joseph, and a daughter, uh, Margarita or Margaret. The son, Jose, was sent back east as a young boy to Maryland, to Baltimore, where William Workman's sister lived, to get a uh -huh. better education that he can get out here. And he remained on the East Coast and then later moved to live with William Workman's brother, David, in Missouri. So he was gone for probably close to a dozen years or so. Paul? Meanwhile... Yes. Um, before we get into the Temple family history uh, going on here, we do have a question from Alan who was asking if the commission and or appeals process goes against you, who winds up with the property? Uh, if the grant is determined to be invalid, then it winds up becoming public government owned land. And then what they would do is turn around and, and distribute that, sell it. Uh, and so that's basically what would happen is you would, you would, that, that was again the government's purpose in appealing all these was hoping that they could get as many invalid um, determinations as possible and then that would free up land for settlers coming out here. One thing I'll mention just quickly as well is that a lot of people who came to California during the gold rush and did not make money because most of them did looking for gold started looking for land and if they were finding a person owning 20, 25,000 or even 5,000 acres that's just so much bigger than you would see in the rest of the United States that there was a lot of agitation to try to open up as much land as possible for these people coming out to California who could, who could farm on smaller pieces of property than the cattle ranches would need, for example. Okay, so yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, Margarita Workman marries, uh, his name was Pliny Fisk Temple when he first came to California. When he married her, he had to become baptized as a Catholic and took the name of Francisco. So he was known as FPF Temple. The couple was married in 1845 and they had a large family, uh, two in the early, uh, late 1840s, several kids in the 1850s and, and more after that. And so as their family is expanding, they're also going to be looking to expand their, their home ranch as well, which I mentioned a little bit earlier was the Lama said, this is Whittier and Arrows. It's kind of amazing. This is a floodplain that is now governed by are controlled by the United States Army Corps of Engineers. There's a dam down there, Whittier Narrows Dam, just a little bit south of this. And so people really can't do much with the property because of its, of its uh, risk as a flood area. But these guys were able to maintain their home here for quite a number of years. And, and, and they did have problems with flooding as we'll talk about in the next presentation. If you kind of want to know where this is, uh, you're basically looking, I believe, pretty much south or southeast uh, this is near the intersection of Rosemead Boulevard, where it meets San Gabriel Boulevard and then Durfee Avenue. And so it's uh, an area today where you don't see a lot of stuff here, but this photograph is a little bit later than the time people were talking about. But there's the Temple family Adobe house. It was an L-shaped building. And you can see a water tower here, fencing. They had quite an enterprise there built up over a number of years. And the Temples moved onto that property about 1851 built the adobe and then just as the wealth came in from the gold rush were able to do a lot of expansion they didn't just have cattle in fact this this portion of the ranch was only about 1200 acres which for cattle ranching you, you can do a certain amount with that but uh, temple probably had to 
mix his herds in with his father-in-law over at La Puente, a much bigger property. But over time as well, there was quite a bit of agriculture being done here. Temple was quite an experimenter. Uh, tobacco, cotton, different types of fruits, uh, field crops, that sort of thing as time goes on. Now, FPF had an older brother, as I mentioned before, a half-brother, Jonathan, who had been here much earlier in the late 1820s, and he opened the first store in the Pueblo of Los Angeles. That store is located basically where Spring Street and Temple Street uh, come together just near City Hall. And Temple was able to acquire that area very early on. And it was going to be, over time, a very significant part of expanding downtown. In 1850, the beginning of the decade, we're talking about or about that time, he built this two-story adobe at an intersection that was that kind of came to a point. So what we're looking at is over here to the left would be Main Street. Just behind the building on this side is Spring Street. The two of them actually met at Temple in those days. It was a triple intersection. Everything's been rerouted since the City Hall project was done in the 1920s. But at that time, this was where he had his, uh, his store and was involved in lots of, of other activities beyond that, but that was where he started doing this thing early on. And this was really one of the first skyscrapers in Los Angeles because most buildings were single story structures were very few two story. And I don't know if there's a sign on top that said temple, this was part of a map where they, I think they wanted to identify that, but I can assume this is temple here with this stovepipe hat and, and his uh, suit on. What he did over time was he became quite involved in some of the uh, early developments beyond the adobe houses that were common in the Mexican era. Again, it's a little bit later photograph, probably the early 1870s. The image I just showed you of that adobe, that would be off here to the left, just a couple hundred yards maybe in this direction. We're looking eastward uh, from a hill. And so the background would be, for example, the Los Angeles River down here. You'd be looking into basically Boyle Heights off to this section. And what Jonathan did is he owned property in this direction. Now again, the plaza, which was the, the historic center of town from the Spanish and Mexican era, is going to be quite a bit to the north, off to the left of the photograph. But as time proceeds, the Americans are starting to build more to the south of that. And the Temple Block, as it became known, was really the core of that new American downtown. In 1857, Jonathan built a two-story building here that was one of the first substantial brick commercial buildings in town. And it was given the name Temple Block, which extended beyond that to the left of the photograph as, as time went on. There was a bit of an island in between Spring, which is right here, and Main Street, which is in the background. And in that island, he built this structure, which was called the Market House. If you've been to Boston or seen photographs of Funil Hall, kind of a famous building out there, that was reportedly the model for this. So these doors, and there were doors on the other end, were for a central hallway on the first floor. And then you can see these little squares off to the side on both sides, little stalls, rooms, where a merchant could lease out space to sell whatever. And then the idea that the temple worked out with the city of Los Angeles was he would build the building and the city would take over responsibility for leasing the stalls. And then the city would take that revenue and be able to, to use that for whatever purposes. The second floor, and this wasn't done until the early 1860s, but was turned into the first, or at least one of the first true theaters in Los Angeles. There were theatrical presentations given in people's homes, but this was the, the first time you had a purpose-built theater in Los Angeles. It didn't last long, we'll talk about that in the next uh, version of this talk. But again, to give you some perspective, LA City Hall basically runs from about where this building is over this direction to the left. And so they, again, had prime property from very early on. And I think Jonathan probably bought this around 1830. Now, beyond his tremendous interest in Los Angeles, uh, Rancho Tejon, the big ranch in Tulare County, he also had, as I mentioned before, some substantial properties on the west coast of Mexico. His son-in-law, there was only one child that Jonathan had with his wife, Rafael Acolta, who was from Santa Barbara, uh, their daughter was Francisca. She married a, a Spaniard named De Ahuria, Gregorio De Ahuria. And uh, De Ahuria came out to, to Mexican California as a speculator. So he would often buy products and then try to sell those to wholesalers uh, or retailers in, in some cases. 
And so while he was out here in Los Angeles, he married into the Temple family, but he was really more active in Mexico and specifically Mexico City. So in the early to mid 1850s, De Ahuria established significant contacts with the government officials. Now the government in Mexico changed very frequently. Basically every year or two, there was a new administration. There were a lot of political battles going on, but there was one figure that De Ahuria was close to named Miguel Comanfort, who became president of Mexico in the mid 1850s. And that was the time when Jonathan Temple decided through his son-in-law that he wanted to lease the National Mint of Mexico. One report suggests that Temple over time paid $500,000 in order to secure that lease. And that is a huge amount of money, especially for somebody living out in remote Los Angeles. And Temple was able to continue that lease until his death in the 1860s. And then his daughter, Francisca de Ahuria, uh, continued the lease into the 1890s. It was finally nationalized by Porfirio Diaz, the dictator of Mexico, in 1893. So just one of the more remarkable things that he was involved in during these years. So we've had uh, members of the Workman and Temple families here from the Mexican era, Jonathan in the 1820s, his brother and, and the Workmans in the early 1840s. William's brother, David, who had been the first of the family to leave their home in the far reaches of Northern England and wound up in central Missouri, lived there for close to 35 or 40 years. But David was a pretty enterprising guy himself. His home base was Franklin, a town along the Missouri River in the central part of that state, but he traded and had mercantile activities in Chihuahua, for example, in Northern Mexico. Came out himself during the gold rush uh, maybe to dig for gold, but also he opened a store. And in 1852, the store that he owned burned down when Sacramento, seven eighths of Sacramento burned down that fall. And so David was wiped out with that venture. He came down to Los Angeles to kind of lick his wounds and, and uh, get sympathy from his brother, William. And William told him, you know, you should really bring your family out here. This area is starting to, to grow. I could use you uh, and use your help for cattle ranching and, and all that. So David returned to Missouri got his family together and they left and went across what would be the California Oregon Trail uh, into Northern California in 1854. They left in April and they arrived here in the Los Angeles area in October. They actually got into Utah and Brigham Young tried to convince them to stay with the Mormon community. Uh, they continued on, they got to Northern California. They uh, then took a ship down the coast from San Francisco to Los Angeles. David went to work for his brother, driving cattle and sheep from La Puente up to the gold mines of uh, Southern Nevada, Sierra Nevadas, especially. He made a couple of these trips. On one of them, unfortunately, in the summer of 1855, this is less than a year after the family had moved out here, a heifer got loose from the herd late at night. David climbed on a mule and in pitch blackness went up a very steep area to, to try and find the, the animal and his mule slipped and David fell down a 200 foot uh, cliff. And so it took a while to, to find his body. And he, this happened about July and they didn't have the funeral until November. So I'm not sure exactly what transpired there. I'm sure the embalming process was part of that. But um, unfortunately, David's death was not long after he brought his family out here. What then happened is, is that David's widow and his three sons, this is one of them, William Henry Workman, moved into Los Angeles. And they later on became pretty prominent folks out there and will continue their story as we go through this series of presentations. Now, David's death is an interesting one in a number of ways. One is, is that it's one of the earliest funerals that I have been able to, to locate where there was some written information about it because newspapers were still relatively new. The first such paper was the Los Angeles Star, which began in the spring of 1851. This is about four years later. The second important thing about this is that it's the first documented burial at El Campo Santo, the cemetery that the Workman family established at the homestead a little east of the house that they had built and, and the cemetery is still there. Now, there may have been other burials before that, but this is the first one that we, that we know of. And because David was a member of the uh, Masonic fraternity, the Free and Associated Masons, whose lodge had just started in Los Angeles in 1854, their original brick building, in fact, is next to the Merced Theater and the Pico House at the Plaza. So you can see that building today. 
because he was a member of the Masonic Lodge, and you see here that they, they noted that the body was brought down on a steamship from the Northern California area, the Masons then oversaw the funeral procession and the arrangements and, and all of that. There's a pretty lengthy article that talks about the funeral. And another reason why this is helpful to us is because it talks a bit about how the working house is laid out. So I just wanna mention that they mentioned, for example, here, a room in the upper portion of the building had been set apart for the reception of the mourners. Now, there was a time when some people at the museum thought upper meant a second floor, but it's really clear that upper actually meant northern part of the house. And then they would they marched to the opposite end of the home from that in which they had formed and entered a large room containing the corpse. So the coffin was, was situated in a room in a area of uh, basically two wings that went south of the house. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And they went down and had the services at the cemetery upon which they got back to the house and brother William Murpin, who was also a member of that same Masonic Lodge, extended the hospitalities of his mansion, such as it was, to about 200 people, which I imagine was mostly an outdoor event, uh, even though this is November. And speaking of La Puente and the Workman family, uh, again, their ability to expand their operations was greatly enhanced by the gold rush, of course, and there were a number of ways in which they were able to do this. This is one of the early photographs of uh, William Workman and his daughter, Antonia Margarita. Now, you might remember the photograph earlier. I can go back to it, actually, it won't take that long. So this is FPF and Antonia Margarita. It's the same photo session as far as we can tell. The, she's wearing the same clothing. The bench appears to be the same. FPF looks pretty, pretty well groomed. His, his jacket looks like it's pretty neat. His hair is combed and all that. But if you look at Mr. Werpen here, it's almost like he wasn't prepared to take a picture and then just sat down. I don't know. He just doesn't look as, as neatly attired. His hair is a little messier. But maybe he was just more salt of the earth than, uh, than his son-in-law. Who knows? In any case, the family expands significantly. Now, they were growing grapes at La Puente early on. The 1850 census, which was actually taken in the very early part of 1851 because of how late California became a state, uh, that census did have an agricultural portion, and it was mentioned that there were grapes being grown and there, were, there was wine on the property. If there's wine, that means there had to be several years before that that the grapes had been growing. So it looks like Workman was doing that not long after he got here, which is not too surprising because wine grapes had been brought by the missionaries. They were grown at the missions and there were others in Los Angeles who were doing that from very early on. Workman had also been a distiller of spirits in New Mexico. So he had some background with this. But here you can see an ad from 1854 in the summer where he's offering his uh, grapes, two exclamation points at the end. Um, by the pound, just a heap of them in the vineyard and people could come by and, and buy the grapes. He would also have the grapes, many of the grapes taken uh, by people who do the pressing and all of that and, and making it into wine. So he was not necessarily making wine or much of it on the rancho probably, but could have others do that for him. In the 1860s, and that'll be the next talk, he starts to do more of that on his own and builds wineries and what have you. As a cattle rancher, he is going to deal with a number of problems. He and John Wollen together, actually. Um, there were several things. One was horse theft uh, or cattle theft as well. Those were things that were very common. Part of that, too, again, is people coming out to dig for gold. Some of them are, are, are people who may be tempted into a life of crime. They see that Los Angeles has ranchers with lots of money and lots of cattle and, and horses, no fences, easy access to the deserts and mountains. It's not that far to get really to uh, Arizona, to Mexico. And so theft was a pretty big concern for the rancheros at that time. And what Workman wound up doing also was he had to have a, a new counter brand. So what you would do is you would brand your animal when it was a, a, a little one, and then people would know what your brand is, but you would do a counter brand to prepare it for sale or transfer to somebody else. And it just, Feels like that. Oh, here it is. Because somebody had been using a false counter brand that was supposed to be Workman's, he had to register a new one. That brand wound up being a logo of the museum. So we have it in various places at the homestead today. This is back in 1855. Workman and Roland also had to take out advertisements warning people of theft of animals. And they had to take out an advertisement in 1855 as well about people who were settling, cutting timber and doing other things on their ranch. Their property was so big at 50,000 acres 
that there were people coming out here to live who felt like either maybe they didn't know it was somebody else's property or if they did, they just felt like, well, they're not going to use it. So I'll take care of that. That was a big problem with a lot of people who came from the southern United States in the early 1850s and settled in what became El Monte. And some of them wound up becoming basically squatters, not just on La Puente, but on some of those ranchos and the Whittier Narrows I mentioned earlier. Another big improvement at the homestead is this pretty remarkable building. So we talked a little bit about the burial of David Workman in the cemetery. William Workman made a trip back to his native England at the end of 1850 into uh, early 1851. And the timing of course was because the gold rush had allowed him to make a substantial amount of money very quickly. And he took that opportunity after nearly 30 years of being away from his home country to go back to England. So he and a friend, David Alexander, who had come to California with John Rowland from New Mexico back in the early 40s, they traveled together and went down the west coast of Mexico, probably to uh, Acapulco, Mazatlan, somewhere along there, and then crossed Mexico to Veracruz, and then took a steamer, uh, presumably, or it could have been a sailing ship perhaps, up into the Caribbean, probably stopped at Cuba and up to New York. They had their photograph taken while they were in New York City the first photo that we know of that Workman had, and it was purportedly taken by Matthew Brady, who became a famous photographer in the Civil War era. Then they made their way to the UK. Alexander was Irish, so he went to the Emerald Isle, and Workman made his way to his hometown. While he was there, he probably got a lot of ideas about what he could do on his own property. When he was in England, for example, he had a tombstone made in marble for his family members at the family's parish church in the little town of Clifton. And so he may have been inspired by what he saw as he was seeing some of the older uh, cemeteries or their buildings. This is a, a Gothic revival chapel that was started probably early in 1857. Uh, bishop Tadeo or Thaddeus Amat, there's a Bishop Amat High School here in La Puente area, uh, came out and blessed a cornerstone at the end of May 1857 and then construction commenced. It was about 48 by 24 so you're talking you know, somewhere around 1,000, 1,100 square feet inside, but brick walls with these uh, towers on it and stained glass windows. You can see probably a little bit of a hint of the stained glass window here. There were gilt ceilings in there, a pretty substantial amount of money to build this in the middle of nowhere and really a show of wealth uh, as well as a as religious part of it. It was named St. Nicholas's, uh, presumably after William Workman's wife, Nicolaso Urioste. Behind the chapel was the burial plot where David Workman was buried just a, a little bit before this chapel was started. So again, these are illustrations of how the money was rolling in and the Workmans were able to expand what they were doing at their homestead. Another would be the house itself. So this is a, a rendering that one of my colleagues did when we were having a team work on the future of the Workman house, uh, probably uh, 10 years or so ago. And what we tried to do with this, this was an internal document, but we, we liked the idea so much of how people could see the change over time that we made it part of the, the exhibit and tour of the building. But what it shows is this adobe core, I-shaped part of the building that the family started with. And you can see it was 19 feet north to south and 72 feet from west to east. There were at least two rooms that were built together. From what we can tell, the center room and the west room were built at the same time. The one on the east, there's a little ramp going down from, from in this area to get into that. It's not built in quite the same orientation, but uh, the adobe bricks though, looked like they were built in the same fashion. So what we're assuming is that maybe they started off with a couple of rooms and added a third to that during the 1840s. It's hard to date a lot of this stuff because there's just not a lot of written records or what have you. But we're making that assumption that they started with these three rooms. They did add adobe rooms to the north, about 120 square feet, a little, bit, little more than that. And this one, however, on the west side is gone. The one on the east side is still there, but there are footings in the basement that are still existing of adobe that give you an exact lineup with the room on the side. So it looks like they had identical rooms here on the north end. What they were used for, we don't know for sure. Maybe travelers or visitors would stay in there. It's hard to say. What we do know, fortunately, one of the grandsons of the workmen's John Harrison Temple, many years later, about 1918, wrote down his recollections of what the house was like when he was a child, a young man, 
he wound up being an owner of the house himself at the end of the, uh, of the 1800s. So for example, he said that there was a dining room in the center, that the Werpen family had their bedroom on the east, and that this was called a reserve room. And then when David Werpen brought his family for that brief period of time in the mid 50s, they stayed in that uh, space there. Over time, these rooms began to change. But because we know that there, was a, a, there were additional rooms, remember I mentioned the upper and lower portions of the house during that funeral, John Harrison was able to provide us some good information about what those rooms were that were built to the south of the house. So up here, I, I've cut off where the adobe core is. What John Harrison Temple says is, is that over time, as they built two long adobe wings that wound up being about 150 feet in extent. On the east, there was a smoking room that William had and there was a fireplace there where he could spend his winter evenings. Next to that was the well room. And in 1918, John Harrison Temple said the well is still there today and it's still here in 2021 uh, and is under this location. It's probably an outdoor well and it got enclosed a little bit later. And then you had a commissary room where there was a, a store basically for the ranch workers to buy clothing and boots and other necessaries, butcher shop and blacksmith shop. On the West Wing, he talks about there being a sitting room that William Workman had underneath that, a kitchen. And there was a basement beneath the house from very early on, the, the adobe core, in fact, under this living and dining room, a substantial part of this is uh, underneath that is a basement probably a wine cellar initially and because of the coolness and all that. So there was an early part of the basement there. And then they expanded the basement under this porch on the south end of the house, this little section, and then also under this room. So he mentions that as well, a school room. So the temple grandchildren were educated there from somewhere in the 1850s, probably all the way into the mid 1870s. Although by the 1870s, they had changed the house and may have moved the school to another portion of the building. And then there was storage for uh, grain, for saddle pieces and what have you on the other parts of the wings. He also mentions a pigeon house over a, a, a gate about 15 or 20 feet wide. And the pigeons were presumably used for food from the way some of these descriptions were. There was a grape arbor in the middle. When that was done, we don't know exactly, but John Harrison Temple does mention that there were tropical fruits and orange trees that were in the courtyard as well. So thanks to him, he was really the first family historian, we were able to, to have some good information about how the house evolved, especially during the 1850s. As you can see in the bottom right here, we, we even color-coded uh, the walls and so forth, and, and, and well, color-coded, pardon me, the, the writing to indicate the time periods. So we can see the, the change over time here. All right, so the guns portion of the presentation, this is a Colt pistol that was owned by FPF Temple, whose name is engraved on a silver plate here on the butt of the pistol. The butt is, uh, you know, this is a pretty expensive gun. It's not, not an ordinary uh, weapon. It was made in 1854 from an 1849 model. And I wanna emphasize the 1849 part for an obvious reason, because just in time for the gold rush, the Colt uh, company back East is making the first six shooter revolver which revolu revolutionized violence, if you wanna put it that way, because a lot of young men were coming out to California from the East and they were carrying these pistols with them. And it was a, a, an advancement of sorts for what you could have with you to uh, either defend yourself or whatever it may be. And so the, the Colt was a, a pretty big impact on the violence that took place here in California during the gold rush years. This uh, pistol has a lot of engraving on it. It was kind of an, a deluxe model. Uh, this is prized by collectors today. And uh, there's quite a story behind that. We'll maybe have to share that at some point. We'll find a way to do that. Uh, it's, had, it's had an interesting history. But the point is that he had this pistol and people would carry weapons with them routinely. William Werpen had a pair of boot pistols. In other words, these were small, uh, smaller caliber guns you would keep in your, in your uh, not smaller caliber, smaller size that you would keep in your boots because you needed those uh, back in those days. The violence, as I mentioned, was partly a result of a lack of government, a lack of law enforcement and courts. There was a very small tax structure back then. And so there wasn't a lot of money available for things like this, even though uh, law enforcement did take up the majority of a county or city budget back then. And the other main reason is there were so many men, young men who were out here, um, there, Wives, mothers, sisters were back east. 
the, the gender imbalance was very, very uh, notable during the gold rush period. And with alcohol flowing, these guns around, and young men with, with hot tempers, not to mention people from all over the world being in one place at one time with very little restriction. So you've got Australians and Chinese and South Americans and Mexicans and Americans and Europeans. It was, it was just rife with the potential for violence back then. And Los Angeles was known as one of the more violent places, if not the most violent place in the United States. Um, murder rates were very high. Some sources say a murder a day was committed. It was nowhere near that high. It was probably more like three dozen a year, but even for a town of just a few thousand, that's an astronomical murder rate. Unfortunately, that murder a day uh, rate is probably gonna stick with us because it's been accepted by so many people. But again, even 30 or 35 murders a year is just, is just is pretty stunning for a town of that size. And that led to a lot of concerns about what to do with this uh, in terms of law enforcement. And so vigilante groups, were very common. They often started by just trying to mimic courts by having popular tribunals where they would appoint a judge and a jury and a prosecutor and a defense attorney and go through the motions of having a trial, even though the, the outcome was pretty much predetermined every time. This is more common in the early 1850s. By the end of the decade, you're gonna see really more of just a mob uh, mentality where people are going to maybe have a public meeting out in front of a building and someone will speak and say, we, we want to you know, serve justice. Uh, who agrees to hang so-and-so? And then the crowd raises their hand or yells, and that's basically it. There, there's no pretense of having a trial any longer. And so that becomes more of the second phase of things. There was one event that involved uh, William Werpen somewhat directly. There was a young man named Felipe Albitre, who was from a longstanding family in the Whittier Narrows area. They were neighbors uh, of the temples. And Felipe Albitre killed a man named Ellington, who lived on the, the Rancho La Puente side of the San Gabriel River. And Albitre later told somebody he just killed Ellington because he thought he might as well. He really didn't have an explanation. He took the man's hat and then rode off. Um, he wound up going down into what is now La Mirada area. And it was a Chilean who was probably there for the gold rush. And he'd be coming back and forth between you know, Chile and, and the mines. And Albitre said that the Chilean made a, a remark he didn't like, so he shot him. And Albitre wound up being caught in a canyon uh, in the, the Chino Hills Brea area. And, but while he was being hunted down, it was rumored that Albitre had been an employee of William Merpins at Rancho La Puente, which is quite possible. A lot of the folks who lived in the Whittier Narrows area worked for these ranchers in, in the local vicinity. So some people from Almonte, who again are mostly white Southerners, who are not favorably disposed to anybody of color, came out to Werpen's house, believing that maybe he was hiding Albitre in the house or on the ranch somewhere and basically threatened him. He showed up at his house and banged on his door and, and demanded that he tell them where Albitre was. And so it, it turned out that Albitre was captured somewhere else. When Albitre was tried in court, he was tried at the same time as an American named um, Brown. And Brown and Albitre were convicted together. They were sentenced to death on the same day. But David Brown's attorney was able to get a stay of execution sent to the governor, uh, pardon me, to the, to the Supreme Court of California to hold the execution pending further review. Albitre's attorney tried to do the same thing, but apparently his stay of execution request was lost uh, before it got up to Sacramento or delayed. And so Albitre wound up being legally executed and a mob showed up and grabbed Brown out of jail and strung him up at the same time. It even featured the mayor of Los Angeles at the head of the mob because he had promised people when Brown was arrested that he would do this if Brown was not legally executed. Of course, he had to follow through and then he wound up being reelected because he had resigned his office and then ran for reelection a few weeks later and got returned to office. That's how crazy that era was in terms of our political and legal system. Another event I'll mention in terms of crime during this period uh, and again, this is a consequence of living out in rural areas in many cases, but another member of the Albitre family, Isidro, who was a cousin of Felipe's, came upon Margarita Temple as she was in her house. FPF, her husband was in Los Angeles or, or elsewhere at the time. And so Albitre broke into the house and started to attack her. She managed to break free and ran out into the fields where some of the laborers were working and called out for help. 
and Obituary had chased her actually out of the house, evidently, uh, and then realized that people were, were being summoned, so he ran off. And so she was able to, to evade him, but when the news got back to Los Angeles, and again, she's a prominent person, uh, married to a pretty well-known figure who had been city treasurer of Los Angeles, who'd been uh, on the first county board of supervisors, a group was formed. And this goes back to what I mentioned just a moment ago about the popular tribunals. This is a transcript of what appeared in the Los Angeles Star. This is in 1853 in the summer. And it talks about the fact that Isidro Albitro, as they mis uh, misspelled it, uh, tried to attack her at her house. And then she gets, she gets into the field and, and he got out there and grabbed her by the neck, but she broke away and, and so forth and got the workmen in the, in the, in the fields to, to get out there. And um, it says a, a detachment of the Rangers, there was a paramilitary group called the Los Angeles Rangers formed earlier in 1853 by citizens. And the Rangers were chartered by the state of California. In other words, they were considered a legal militia. These were not uncommon in parts of America during the early years of the country. And they were actually given money to acquire weapons um, and, and so forth. And their, their job was to kind of help in some cases not help, the sheriff and the marshal, because we're very few law enforcement officers. And so these citizens were often engaged to go out and hunt down criminals. Well, in this case, the rangers and many of our most substantial citizens went out to examine the case. So this is a popular tribunal. They're actually going to have a meeting. And you can see here, they appoint a chairman uh, who was a, a guy named Samuel Arbuckle, an auctioneer, an actual judge in Los Angeles called the meeting to order, Jonathan Scott. Who was, who was a legally appointed judge. This is Stephen C. Foster, who wound up, who at the time was on the County Board of Supervisors, I believe. He became the secretary. He was the mayor who resigned to lead the lynching party of David Brown, I just mentioned a moment ago. So this was not his first time at this kind of a, a rodeo, so to speak. David W. Alexander, I mentioned him before. He was a good friend of William Workman, traveled with him to the UK a couple of years before. John Reed, son-in-law of John Rowland, the co-owner of Rancho La Puente, but also Andres Pico. So it was not uncommon for Californios, especially from the upper classes that are on Chero class, to be part of these po popular tribunals. Pico had been a suitor, uh, purportedly, of Margarita before she married FPF Temple. And Andres Pico, a few years later, would lead lynching parties when the sheriff of Los Angeles was killed in 1857. Uh, Pico was a, a widely respected figure. He had actually won as the commander of the only major battle the Californios uh, were able to defeat the Americans during the Mexican-American War. So he was widely respected for his abilities in a, in a martial or military sense. In any case, there was a jury of 12 to decide the case here. And, and several of these men are part of the Los Angeles Rangers, Sanford, Brevort, Sublet, uh, Morgan, uh, Brinkerhoff. They're all members of that. Getman had been a sheriff and marshal. Uh, prior to this. This is Jonathan R. Scott, who was the same judge. So he wanted to become a member of the jury. So a judge is a jury member in this popular tribunal. And one uh, California, Juan Maria Sepulveda, is spelled here, uh, is also part of that jury. And they had an examination. The jury retired. They don't say how long they were away. It was probably a matter of minutes. And they came back and rendered their verdict, which was that Isidro Albitre was not to be lynched in terms of executed or hung. Instead, he was to get 250 lashes. Now, 10 lashes, 20 lashes, 50 could be an immense uh, agony for a person. It's hard to imagine what 250 lashes would have done to the Cedro Albitre. It was probably a death sentence in itself because he died the following year and it may very well have been from the results of his injuries. So this is an example of just what was going on in uh, Los Angeles during parts of the 1850s, and this one relating particularly to the Workman and Temple families. So hopefully you've got a sense of, of at least some of the, the more notable things that were going on in the greater Los Angeles during this really remarkable decade. This is a map of uh, public, uh, pardon me, of the land claims process. They drew these maps every year to identify where the ranchos were that were in the process. This is from 1857. There were only two ranchos that had been surveyed by that point. One of them was Rancho San Pedro, 
owned by the Dominguez family early on. The other was Rancho Portrero Grande, which I had mentioned earlier, was at that point owned by Juan Matias Sanchez and William Workman and FPF Temple. Uh, and over time, there would be more of these, but um, it's just kind of a neat map from that time period. And so we've gone from the 1850s, we'll move into the 1860s with our next presentation, uh, the first part of May. It'll talk about the first half of the decade being really traumatic, almost revelations type with uh, flooding, with drought, with um, invasions of insects. It's, it is almost like what Revelations talked about. Uh, smallpox, uh, really a dire time, the first half of the decade. And then in the second half, after the Civil War, things really start to change and Los Angeles begins to undergo its first significant period of growth. We'll put the Workman Temple families in context of all that for you. So look for that uh, the early part of May. There's Sunday, May 2 at 2 o'clock. In the meantime, we have a couple other major events coming up here for the, for the rest of the month. My colleague, Michelle Muro, who has been doing workshops like this for a long time, will have one. Uh, it's a practical way of, if you've got old uh, booklets and pamphlets that you want to preserve, it's always a good idea to remove the staples and, and, and then rebind them where the staples were, because the staples will rust, that will leach onto the paper, could cause damage over the long term. So she will give you a really good grounding on how to do that. That'll be on the 23rd from 10 to 1130. And then my colleague, Jenny Trulock, who has been handling most of the female justice series of presentations now, I think this is the third year, will be kicking off 2021 series with a really interesting discussion about Amy Semple McPherson, one of the more remarkable figures in early 20th century Los Angeles. A rare example of a woman in a position of authority and power, in this case with um, evangelical religion and so she'll talk about a really remarkable event from 1926 involving Sister Amy, as she was known. You can sign up for these events at homesteadmuseum.org forward slash upcoming slash events. Probably uh, not the name of that little thing there, but you can see it, uh, dash. And then you can follow us on our different social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So with that, I'll turn things over to Alex and see if you have any other questions. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, thank you so much, Paul. You gave so many good teasers for part four of this program, which is gonna be coming up in May. So that's exciting. I hope many folks here will join us. We recognize many names of folks who have been here for parts one and two and three today. So thank you so much for continuing to be engaged with us while we're doing programs virtually. Uh, we've got a few comments. Um, from Dana on Facebook, wonderfully researched presentation. Uh, we have family member Cheryl Temple who is saying she learned some new things today. Thank you so much. And she's also remembering uh, memories that Gary has had, her husband, of playing with that Colt pistol when he was young. Um, Ernie Cortez says, thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much from Annette. Okay, we'll give folks a minute if anybody wants to type any questions they may have from today's program there in the Q&A, we'll give you a minute to do so. All right. Uh, Eliseo says, thanks, Paul. Happy New Year. Yeah. As usual, fascinating. Thanks for joining us, Clark. Janet says, nice presentation, learned some interesting facts. Thank you. Okay, we have a question. Let's see what we got here. Oh, that's Mary Bartley, another family member saying, thank you so much. She learned a lot. Okay. Hi, Mary. Okay, give a minute more here. Um, Annette asks on Facebook, was David Workman's body moved? Now there's a good story for you. There is a good story there. Um, the, the descendants of David wanted to move him. And so they approached Walter P. Temple, who owned the, the homestead in the late teens and into the early 30s about it. And he said, no, he would not agree to do that. Uh, he himself moved David's body actually from the burial ground behind where the chapel was to a mausoleum built where the chapel used to be. Uh, the mausoleum was finished in the early 20s. So David was only moved a few feet. There is a very large uh, monument marker in Evergreen Cemetery in Boyle Heights that has David's name on it, his 
date of birth, date of death. So people would go there and, and maybe think that he was buried there, but and maybe that was the intention. They thought they would do that and then convince the, the workmen's and temples to have him moved. It never happened. So David uh, is resting in a mausoleum at the homestead today, El Campo Santo. Yeah. Hey, Mark says, thank you, Paul. Great presentation. Yeah. Such interesting history. Folks are looking forward to more. Great. We like to hear that. Yeah, and Annette was saying, who asked about David, she said she has seen that monument. Right. So there at, at uh, Evergreen. Okay, well, I think that's gonna do it for us. Thanks again so much, folks. Thank you, Paul, for putting this program together for us. We look forward to seeing you at upcoming programs. And again, if you missed any of today's program, um, we will have a link available either off of our website to take you to our YouTube channel where we have recordings of past programs or we'll share here on social media. So thanks so much. Um, those of you who joined us on Zoom, uh, you will uh, expect to get an email um, tomorrow with a very short evaluation that we ask that you complete for us to give us any valuable feedback you have. We appreciate all of, of that input. Um, if you joined us today on Facebook Live, that link is already placed in the comment box. So with that, we hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks again so much for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.